Excellent. Right. I'm going to uh, formally start this afternoon's webinar. So uh, to begin with, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Crispin Thorne. I'm the Area Director for the Forest Commission for Yorkshire in the North East, and I'm uh, proud to be chairing uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar on uh, woodland creation in practice. Just a few housekeeping um, notes before we get started. It's quite a large group. Uh, we're expecting um, over 100. So you have been joined to the webinar with your cameras and microphones off rather than um, being on. And it's the speakers um, which have got the cameras and microphone option. The chat is open for questions and we'd like you to use the chat function to ask questions to our speakers. So feel free to start populating that when we get underway. And also just to say this session will be being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel and for those that want to um, pick up any uh, aspects of it after the event. Uh, so that's the housekeeping uh, elements. Just um, giving you a quick overview of the agenda. Uh, the first speaker will be Ewan Downey. He's the programme manager for the White Rose Forest and he's going to give you an overview of the White Rose Forest partnership. It's great to have Ewan here. Then we've got Anna Quigan, who is the Woodland Creation Officer with Leed City Council. Um, she's previously worked with uh, the United Bank of Carbon as a Natural Capital Valuation Officer. Anna is going to be giving the main presentation of the project itself. And then we'll be finishing off with uh, Kat Scott and Tom Sloan from the University of Leeds, who will be giving an overview of the monitoring and evaluation of the project itself. Um, in the background, uh, we've got Robin Gray, who's the Forest Commission's Landscape and Woodland Design Advisor, uh, and also Paul Nunns, who's one of our Woodland Creation Officers. They're there to help answer uh, questions in the chat uh, as we go along. So um, we've got some technical support from Robin and Paul. Um, and just before we turn to the first um, presentation, I just wanted to say a couple of kind of opening remarks, really. And it's great to have this webinar on Woodland Creation. Um, obviously, woodland creation is a key priority as we look to respond to the kind of nature crisis and the climate change challenge. There's a huge commitment from governments, local authorities and partners, all setting ambitious targets for woodland creation. Um, if you look at the, wood, the government's uh, ambition, that's 30,000 hectares per year by the end of the current parliament across the UK. Uh, you will pick up on some of other local targets, the three and a half thousand hectares between 2021 and 2025 as part of the planting for our future document with the White Rose Forest. This is a real strong level of ambition for woodland creation, which is great to see. There's also significant resources being put forward towards woodland creation through the Nature for Climate Fund. There's over 640 million pounds, so it's great to see that level of investment. But ultimately, it's about how we do it well and how we get successful establishment, which um, re requires kind of good design, good due diligence. Um, so, you know, this uh, webinar provides an excellent opportunity to learn from others and hear from those that are already kind of uh, practicing uh, this important um, aspect of getting trees in the ground. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Ewan Downey. He's the program manager with the White Rose Forest, and he's going to give you an overview of the White Rose Forest partnership. So over to yourself, Ewan. Thanks. Thanks, Crispin. Um, hopefully um, everyone can see my slides. Um, it's a, this is a very brief introduction um, to the White Rose Forest, um, just sort of setting out who we are, where we operate, and a little bit about our process and, and why we've uh, supported uh, projects such as Gare Wood. So we're part of um, the community forests in England. There are currently 13 of us. This map shows where we are located um, throughout England. So if you're unfortunate that you don't live in Western North Yorkshire, there may well be a, a community forest in your area um, that can help um, support you with your woodland creation ambitions. If you want more and to know more details about each forest, um, England's community forest.org.uk is the place to go for uh, information. So the White Rose Forest, uh, who are we? Well, we are a community forest, but we're also a partnership. Um, it's a joint venture of a number of organisations such as local authorities, agencies, NGOs, charities and uh, community groups 
who are all coming together with the ambition of um, looking to increase woodland cover and hopefully in time woodland management across uh, North and West Yorkshire. So that's where we are, we are based. So we're covering sort of the, the big towns and cities in West Yorkshire, but also, you know, we do cover the whole of the county of uh, North Yorkshire and the city of York as well. And alongside Haywood City of Trees and Mersey Forest, we provide the uh, the centrepiece of the Northern Forest, which um, some people may well have heard of. As Crispin um, said, that we have a we have a plan uh, where we're trying to um, convert and translate those national targets into what it means locally for us, and also as well as just um, increasing woodland cover per se, trying to give some indication of the kind of woodland cover that we're looking to create. In particular, our two main programmes, which are Landscapes for Water, which as might suggest is looking to create new woodlands and catchments, which will hope, hopefully reduce uh, the risk of flooding uh, downstream and in the future, and also Green Streets, where we're targeting our main transport corridors, areas of deprivation, industrial zones, etc to reduce uh, pollution and to provide uh, green infrastructure and uh, green transport corridors uh, for the future. We, uh, within the White Rose Forest, we offer um, a service which we uh, describe as our delivery pathway. And uh, it's uh, it, it, probably the best way of sort of describing it is that kind of we, we can offer a, a bespoke service to any uh, landowner or partner who's interested in woodland creation. Um, the phase is that we sort of cover everything from engaging with landowners through assessment and scoring of sites, looking at the suitability for woodland creation, um, engaging in multidisciplinary design to make sure it's the right tree in the right place and it's capable, the projects of getting through regulatory approval, working with uh, landowners and their agents to ensure that they get the best funding option. There are a lot of funding options that are available, whether you're in urban settings or rural. Um, so, for example, we have Trees for Climate, the Forest Commission, uh, Administer UCO and the Woodland Trust Grow Back Greener. So just some of the schemes that are available to people. And so we try and make sure that we work with the with the, uh, the partners involved to make sure that, you know, it's it's the best package that delivers what uh, the design and the sort of funding requirements that are needed in order to be able to deliver the woodland. Once that's all agreed, we make sure that people um, have got the right pathway into getting a, a, a grant agreement to make sure that the funding is secure and where we can look to support through the planting and establishment, either through funding, support, guidance, advice, etc., to take everyone through, um, hopefully, to an established woodland in 10 to 15 years time. If you sort of pick up on um, Gare Wood, you know, where we were sort of fitting in, clearly there was an ambition from the landowner to plant woodland and you'll hear an awful lot about sort of the work that they did, the multidisciplinary design process. So in our, our role was there to support the steering group that was established to set up to give some advice um, and potentially, you know, where we could if, if required additional resources in order to get through that process, which can be complicated and uh, time consuming and then to make sure that they are aware of all the options that are available, the implications, et cetera, in order that they can decide and make the best choice. On this occasion, they did pick uh, the White Rose Forest uh, Trees for Climate Scheme, and we now have a grant agreement in place, which has funded the planting and is starting, you know, and as well as some of the other infrastructure that's required in creating a, a community woodland of this scale. And we'll, we'll build on this relationship going forward in order to uh, you know, deliver this woodland and, and, and realise the sort of the ambitions that have been set out. So we are very keen to support it in whatever capacity that we have, and hopefully um, you'll, you'll hear much more about what's been achieved on site, but definitely uh, a, a you know, high quality scheme and one that we're very pleased to be associated with. If you need more information from the White Rose Forest, please email us at whiterosforest at kirklees.gov.uk or we have a website if you want to know more about what we can offer. 
Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Ewan. Uh, we have got the question slot at the end of the presentation, so we've got 15 minutes for questions at the end of these speakers. Do please put your questions in the chat and we'll be able to pick them up from that route. Uh, moving on to the next uh, uh, speakers, because it's a, a, a joint uh, connected presentation, we've got Anna Quigan from uh, uh, formerly the United Bank of Carlin, who was a natural capital valuation officer and is now the Leeds City Council Wooden Creation Officer. She's going to lead the presentation of uh, an overview of the project itself, why it was created and how it was delivered and what the next steps are for the scheme. And then they'll be closely followed by Kat Scott and Tom Sloan from the University of Leeds covering the um, monitoring and evaluation. So um, over to Anna. Ben. Thank Thanks. you, Chris. Ben, I'll just share my screen. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen OK? Yes, that's full screen. I know that's fantastic. Thanks very much. Great. Lovely. Well, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about the process of the design. And um, the first thing to say is about the name. And the name Garewood comes from Roger Gare, who is the secretary of the university for over 20 years. And he retired in 2022 and the woodland was named after him. So just getting our bearings, um, it's the site is in North Leeds. It's on the edge of the city. And the university has owned this land for a while and it was um, leased out to a tenant farmer for grazing. And the site is 30, over 37 hectares, which included um, three and a half hectares of existing broadleaf woodland, which was plantation. And I'm going to describe the project in the four stages that it, we went through. And it was overall a two year project. But um, I'm going to focus mostly on the design stage. But the project definition, the first step, is important because whenever you have a project, the views of the landowner is obviously very important. And in this instance, the landowner is an institution. So we had to work out a method for decision making. And the whole project came about through discussions within the university um, from the sustainability service and various other groups because the sustainability service have set up the climate plan for the university and this woodland forms a very small part of that climate plan. The um, sustainability service were the obvious project owner and they delegated the delivery of the project to the United Bank of Carbon, UBOC team of which I was part at the time. And so project design, project management and, and, and all of the detail was delivered by the UBOC team. And but decision making was made by the steering group. And this included a, a range of representatives from across the university. And as you and alluded to, um, we asked the White Rose Forest to be a um, part of that as well. So the first thing you do in creating a woodland is to decide your objectives. There are many things you can do with a site like the um, Gare Wood site. Research and teaching um, as a university it is an obvious opportunity in terms of its accessibility to students and um, it is really a living laboratory. But Kat Scott and Tom Sloan will talk about that in more detail next. Biodiversity, it's important for the university across the whole of its estate. Um, so there's a sensible and important objective to include in the woodland design. Contribution to the university's climate plan was also important. And if um, I would encourage you to look at the sustainability service um, climate plan. They have a website with all the detail on it. And um, it's important to note, though, that the woodland creation is not instead of emissions reduction. It is the offsetting for the residual emissions that um, is part of uh, the overall climate plan. 
And finally, benefits to the university and local communities. The university has a strong commitment to being a good neighbour and there's um, volunteering opportunities as well as additional public access. I know you can't see the detail of this, but these four colours of this um, diagram was the four phases of the project. And these are the tasks we identified at the beginning. So going on to the design stage, we were following the Forestry Commission design guidance so that we had a UK forestry standard compliant woodland. And there's five key documents within that. So I'm going to talk you through those documents, how we produce them and just um, focus in on certain elements of it. And with a little bit of detail occasionally about how we got to those um, conclusions. So starting with the landscape context plan, the first of those documents, these were all the documents we produced were A0 and had a lot of information in them. But in terms of the landscape context plan, the first thing we had to do was demonstrate our objectives, which I've um, shown you already, but also look at what is there now and what is, um, and that's not just looking at the map, it's also looking at details such as which river catchments are they in? And for example, on this site, there's um, the water to the north will drain into the river wharf and the, the water to the south will drain into the river air. So it's understanding the site in that level of detail from desk based studies. And part of that research is looking at the landscape policies and we considered national, regional and local down to parish council level. And all those policies were pointing in the same direction, which was as the, at the edge of the city, this countryside feel, this rural feel was really important to preserve. And so um, and this also feeds into the, the the key element of this design. So this site, it is um, it is an undulating site and you get some great views of the city. So the, the busy horizon and yet you feel you're that you're in the countryside in a rural setting, even though you're so close to the city. And this is um, the spirit of place on site and very important to consider in our designs. Just to emphasize that further, what I've done here is taken an aerial photograph and faded to black and white anything that did not conform to landscape character. And um, you can see how the city feels like it's pushing out towards this area. And that was why we wanted to preserve that rural feel. Finally, also in the landscape context plan, it's really important to see how your site fits in with the surrounding landscape. And then we've got Golden Acre to the west. We've got Eckup Reservoir, um, which is a triple SI to the east. And so there's a great opportunity to connect these um, green infrastructure spaces. But there's complications to that. Um, and this again reflects the urban pressures. So while the roads look rural, they are in fact busy with traffic, fast, heavy volumes and lots of quarry lorries. So when you come out, this first photograph on the left, when you come out of Golden Acre Park on the Meanwood Valley Trail or the Leeds Country Way, which both follow this route, you then have to um, tackle uh, quite a tricky road junction to then get towards the Garewood site. And the second photograph shows the footpath for the Meanwood Valley Trail and the um, Leeds Country Way. So an opportunity to improve that. And also here an image from the Bramhope and Carlton Parish Council website, which shows the um, red paths of the existing network. And then within that purple circle is the site. And you can see there's a bit of a gap. So there's an opportunity to improve the con connectivity of the footpaths. Next to the site appraisal plan. And this is a combination of all the background information, including a lot of site assessment. And the idea of the um, site appraisal plan is to, is to provide a summary. So we've got here in this inset map, if you can see my mouse, um, the um, access points, the entrances, whether they're old or, or in use. We also had a, a formal um, um, the, the image at the bottom with the arrows on it, this reflects the land form and it's more often used in more mountainous areas. But as the land was undulating, we thought, well, the design needs to consider the land shape and land form. 
But the main purpose of the site appraisal is to take all the information and simulate it and then highlight the constraints and opportunities. And we do this by zoning the site. And these are called landscape character areas. And we had six at Garewood. So we had number six shown here is the existing woodland. Number three is the central infrastructure, which was the agricultural buildings and the tracks and paths um, in, in a cluster around the middle. But zones one, two, four and five reflected the soil types. And I wanted to highlight a, um, just some of the constraints and opportunities for one of those zones. And this is what is um, covered for all the zones on the site appraisal plan. So in zone one, it's sandy loam, so it's free draining. And this was a quite in quite a lot of contrast to the um, clay glay, which is in two and four and dominates the site. There's also constraints of the power line and the hedgerow at the southern part of zone one is a priority habitat. Just going down next to the detail um, which uh, informed those zones. So we use the Forest Research Ecological Site Classification, which um, uses soil maps and climate models to give you uh, recommendations of species in the future um, that will cope with future climates. But also we, had, as recommended, dug soil pits. And this was the work of Tom Sloan. And, um, ascertained by looking at vegetation, um, sort of what it will grow well in that area. And finally, not only an opportunity to connect um, footpaths, but a, an opportunity to connect existing fragments of woodland in the area. So next is the site concept plan. This is the first opportunity to draw up a design and to then go to um, stakeholders and discuss the design and um, modify as a result. And we had two types of stakeholders in this project. The first one was the steering group. There were lots of voices and lots of opinions and we wanted to make sure we had a clear understanding of everybody's views. And we used this design concept of the rural urban scales. And it was because we've, we know it's on the edge of the city and we've got these urban pressures. So while we are creating a rural feel, we're going to have to put in infrastructure like reinforced paths if there's heavy footfall. And, we, and it was getting the precise flavour of that rural urban balance that we really wanted to explore. And the result from the steering group consultation was keep it as rural as you can, but with a focus on teaching and research. This is the um, concept plan that we took to the public consultation in June 2022. It's been deliberately drawn to be sketchy, to give that feel that is incomplete and that, that, that the um, plans will change, which is an important um, point to make across to um, the public and to the stakeholders when you're talking to them at this point. You can see that there's horizontal green lines, which is areas of tree planting, and then there's some dotted areas, which is area of natural regeneration. And then with, this is the, what we presented to the public consultation. So a summary of the um, design of the site. So it's an accessible woodland with a rural character. It's native or regionally appropriate broadleaf woodland under a continuous cover forestry, so no timber harvesting. Mixed habitat and ponds to improve biodiversity. We were very focused on trying to get the mosaic of habitats on this site. So it's, it's, it's much more than just planting trees for carbon. It's about having a good biodiverse um, site. Public access paths going north, south, east and west with phased opening of those paths, um, prioritising the uh, southern one which was the alternative path to the Leeds Country Way and Meanwood Valley Trail. And in terms of public access this was the um, concept and um, the area of lime green is public access and grey is private space for research, teaching or biodiversity. And there is some existing public access and the existing woodland and it was around 20% public access in the final woodland design. 
But when we discussed um, with stakeholders, with the Forestry Commission, with the White Rose Forest and many other people um, to develop the final woodland creation plan. And this is it. And it, um, And I'm going to talk you through various elements as we go through and show you what was different from the concept plan. I have faded out to black and white um, areas that we're not looking at so we can see, um, for example, in this case, it is the viewpoints. We wanted to preserve viewpoints and this is the, the main one with um, to the east is the one we showed in the drawing earlier which has a great view back to the city and also the shape of that woodland follows the landform. The um, other views are for the neighbours' properties to retain their view across the site. In terms of biodiversity, I've just drawn some arbitrary lines here, but just to illustrate, we um, we wanted to, uh, we left space uh, at the request of the historic and the archaeology um, to allow the stone walls to, be tree free. So these are the natural places to then have the east west rides, which are very important for the light. And you can see that there's brown areas which are um, scrub and it's there's smaller, more widely spaced, sort of like a, the form of a young woodland and it will be maintained as that. And then there's the areas of darker um, green, which is uh, the more to, uh, densely planted woodland. There's also easement for the priority habitats, for um, which are the hedges, there's the ponds, and there's also an area of glade in amongst the deep, um, the darkest part of the um, woodland. Access for maintenance and emergencies is really important, and all our paths are one mower's width ride to save costs and time for the uh, maintenance team. And also we, we're adding in additional um, boundaries going back to the old shape of the fields in the past and we will um, we have to also allow for forestry vehicle access in the event of a, a, a pest and disease problem. So it was making sure that um, all elements um, and all needs for this space were considered in the design. Following discussions with stakeholders the design for the public access was altered to more of a through route feel rather than circulatory and um, also in their discussions, the, there were some antisocial behaviour problems on the northeast, which was of concern. So we modified the design of the woodland in the north um, to reflect their concerns. Overall, the statistics, 22 hectares of woodland um, creation with um, two, um, two hectares of natural regeneration. And when you combine that with the existing woodland, it comes to around 25 hectares of woodland or 67% canopy cover. And the, um, but it's not just canopy cover, it's how that is structured. And the advice we're, um, because of the unknown climate is to diversify your mix. So we looked at the results from the ecological site classification. We had somebody from the biology department looking at all the national vegetation classifications for the surrounding woodlands. And we just observed what was growing well. And so they conform to the NVCs of W10 or W6, wet woodland, lowland broadleaf woodland. And these are the mix that we put on our wish list. We didn't get everything we wished for, but we got most of it. And finally, we're using the Woodland Trust's definitions here where we have more open spaces in terms of planting, more dense places. We have scrub and we've got glades and rides. So really playing around with that idea of light levels to maximize biodiversity. And the implementation plan, um, there were many versions of this, so I'm going to skip back to the project stages now before I go on to the implementation plan and that stage. So the, we had the approval stage. So what we followed the Woodland Creation Planning Grant between January and July 2022, and we submitted to the Environmental Impact Assessment in September 2022 with approval coming in on early November. So going back to the implementation stage now and looking at the plan, this is version eight, it's the final plan and it you can see it's much simpler, but it is um, 
the result of many iterations because we were working with the Riverside Stewardship Company, who were the contractors, to really get the information they needed to get the job done. And um, you can see there are also some white squares on there. Hopefully you can make that out. Kat Scott and Tom Sloan will talk about that in more detail. That's the area of, um, of research planting. So overall, there were 66,000 trees, the majority of which planted by contractors. The ground preparation was minimal to reduce carbon loss. It was only grass cutting. There was no ripping or any um, decompaction to the soil. And because we wanted a complex organic shape woodland from the beginning, it makes marking out a challenge. So we used a mobile mapping tool, um, ArcGIS field maps, to um, to mark out and it made it a lot easier. The trees were provided by Lee City Council's Arium Nursery who um, provide and grow their own locally sourced trees and uh, sourced from elsewhere when we needed it. And these trees are cell grown and um, this was an, um, the first delivery and it, it's um, we were very grateful to the area to the estates team and to Riverside Stewardship Company because this stage of the project was very busy. So we got approval in November. Planting started in early January. So we we had a quite a condensed time to get the project um, set up. In terms of tree protection, we assessed the threats and the, the sig most significant one was from hairs. So we've got 75 centimetre tree tubes um, to, and which will be recovered and recycled. There's some additional fencing, um, most of which is temporary and it is um, dividing public and private space. There is one area of deer fencing around the area of natural regeneration. So in terms of timelines, the first tree was planted on the 2nd of December by Roger Gare and the last tree was planted on the 3rd of March and the contractors took around six weeks to plant the 60,000 trees. So the Estates Department is now managing the site. And just to say thank you very much to everyone involved. It was, a, um, as you would imagine, a lot of people involved in this project. Um, these are the project partners, but again, a lot of people within the University of Leeds. And to end here now with the image of um, Gare Wood as perceived by um, artist James Mackay, and this is from the interpretation board on the centre of the site, and it's how the wood will um, be in 2030. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, uh, can everybody uh, uh, can everybody see that uh, presentation now? Yeah, now that's coming through um, clear. And, and just a quick reminder for there's a couple of questions in the chat, but uh, feel free to populate it with a couple more. I'll pass back over to Captain Tom to lead us through the uh, University of Leeds research and teaching aspects. Thanks. That's great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Tom Sloan and along with uh, Kat Scott, I am one of the scientific leads on the Gearwood project and I'm going to talk to you about how we have tried to embed our research and teaching here at the University of Leeds into the project. Um, so Anna's talked you through a lot of these objectives that we had for the site. We're talking about research and teaching, as I've said. I think the important thing to mention here is although there were Kind of different demands arising from each of these objectives they weren't mutually exclusive and in fact a lot of the other objectives such as increasing biodiversity really raised a lot of interesting questions for research and have allowed us to kind of plan our program around that so what what are the consequences of increasing biodiversity what's the most effective method or say if we look at uh, the point on the university's climate plan you know how are trees sequestering carbon and what's the most effective way to do that so our the research and teaching is really is really kind of fed into uh, a lot of the other objectives that we've had so research and the, the kind of academic community of leads have, have been involved in the project in in two main strands the first is to help anna's design work um, by applying our expertise from the academic community um, to the project. So that's taken the form mostly of um, we have a large life sciences um, 
departments here and um, you know we've used experts say ecologists um, from the biology department to to inform about species diversity here in our own department school of earth and environment we have experts on climate change and how uh, trees sequester carbon who've also been able to to advise us provide provide advice on what good practice will look like for a forest of this type and also assist with with the the kind of practical implementation of the project getting on site and gathering data uh, and so they've contributed to the design and answered questions as required then the second strand has been you know once Anna has produced that design to to think about how we are going to integrate research and teaching so an example of the uh, of the first strand is you, you saw this in Anna's presentation, but just to just to show you that we have because we have soil scientists in the department, we were able to to go onto the site and dig soil pits, look at to make sure we have, say, uh, sufficient rooting depth uh, and to also uh, ground truth the, um, the the maps that that we have available as part of the uh, ESC process and then also provide detail beyond what's on those maps, so where the soil horizons are, questions about nutrient regime, and that's all allowed us to um, provide a lot more information than you would perhaps expect to the ESC process and make sure that we have um, designed a woodland that it is as suitable in terms of the tree assemblage as possible and as resilient to climate change as possible. The second strand has been to involve the research community in designing research and teaching on the site. Um, the first stage of that was a university wide consultation pro, uh, process with the aim of designing a site that facilitates cross disciplinary research and supports innovative teaching. To begin with, we uh, sent out a questionnaire, a questionnaire, a questionnaire to colleagues uh, who we thought might be interested in the project. Uh, and the figure on the right of your screen shows a word cloud of, of responses that we got. Uh, we had a really good uptake of responses. Um, some things that came through quite clearly and the respondents have then gone on to form the basis of our interest group here at the university and have been kept informed consulted sent students to us uh, and really helped out with the with the design and implementation of the project the consultation process and our subsequent conversations also uh, give us a number of questions that we began with now this isn't an exhaustive list of questions that we are going to ask on the site but it was the questions that we were kind of holding in our head as as the design pro process progressed the first three of these questions relate more to the to the monitoring of the site um, as we've established it and then the the fourth question which Kat's going to talk a little bit more about goes more towards the the um, design the experimental design part of the site that, that Anna alluded to in her later slides but these broad questions included um, the differences between directly planted areas and natural regeneration and as Anna said that's fed into the design and we now have an area of just over two hectares I believe of um, naturally regenerating woodland that will be compared to the more conventionally planted woodland uh, the effectiveness of mammal management strategies which is being spearheaded by our colleague Alistair Ward from um, the biology department who has um, uh, uh, tasked a number of students to help design this this program for us uh, and how do ecosystem services provided by this land change as a result of woodland creation uh, at the site and that includes more um, uh, more of our uh, colleagues from humanities as well as uh, hopefully a potential collaboration with forest research which should be getting underway soon and as I say, Kat's going to touch on this final question of species diversity and woodland development. So all of this uh, has led to a baseline monitoring campaign. So uh, not to dwell on this too much, but the dots on these maps all represent um, data that we've collected before the before the trees were in the ground, just to give us an idea of the conditions on site um, before planting. Uh, and to break this down, uh, that's included soil and vegetation characteristics in the existing woodland and the ESC work that I've talked about. Uh, invertebrate bird deer and browsing mammal surveys as we've mentioned and it's been largely student-led vegetation surveys by our colleagues from the biology department and we're hoping is an annualized data set collected by undergraduates as part of their training and plant identification soil surveys going a little bit beyond ESC so that's including nutrient car carbon and sort of really digging into the soil characteristics so that's formed the baseline and then this year we're looking at weather station and installing data loggers at some of our sampling points so to collect soil temperature um, and looking to colleague, colleagues to help us plan air quality and greenhouse gas flux monitoring campaigns as well as if we can secure the funding look at the, looking at rhizosphere diversity so how the uh, bacteria and fungus in the soil change. 
So that's it for the monitoring and I'll pass over the cat for some of the other research. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, so yeah, we had two main types of, of planting that took place on the site. So in um, Anna's maps, and I'll, and I'll show one in a second, you might have seen some little um, kind of grid squares dotted across the across the site. That's because we wanted to separate out um, one or a couple of spe specific areas for some ex experimental planting. So these made up about 10 percent of the, of the trees on the site. The remaining the remaining 90 percent was um, planted by the the, the, for the forestry contractors who were who were planting trees. Um, so they were they were fantastic and they were really kind of flexible with us about how we could kind of um, you know embed our experiments alongside the kind of more usual planting that they were doing. Um, and so this the experimental aspect of this was um, designed to look at the impact of um, different planting densities, but also the different um, diversity mixtures that we're using on site. So just to explain that a little bit more, um, this is a kind of a, a representation really of how we've laid out these, these grids. So in this case, um, the dark green area is, is a higher density planting area and the lighter green area is a, is a lower density planting area. Um, and they would have both had the same overall tree mixtures, you know, across those those broader areas. But within each 10 meter by 10 meter grid square, we were very specific about the number of different tree species that were in there. So it ranged all the way from from one species. So for those 10 by 10 meter grids, they were just monocultures of a species of oak. All the, all the way through four species, eight species, and then the most dense um, grid squares had 12 different tree species in. And we wanted to do this so that we could understand how those different levels of diversity would affect how fast the trees grow, how the, the kind of characteristics, the sort of surface atmosphere um, and, and soil are, are changing uh, and how it influenced the diversity of other species of wildlife that were that were using the site, like whether we could draw out any distinctions between them. And so to to plant that mixture, um, we, we let the contractors kind of get on with planting the, the majority of the trees, but we actually ran a series of volunteer events for um, students and staff of the university, but also members of the local community. Um, and we had over 300 volunteers come along and help us. Um, they were very patient with, uh, with our um, slightly mad scheme of getting them to kind of mark out these uh, 10 by 10 grid squares and, and divide them up um, and then plant exactly the species that we asked them to um, in the site. So it, re it required an extra level of data recording, which is why we couldn't just kind of plant these trees in the same way as um, as all the others. So this is just a couple of photos of some of our very uh, enthusiastic volunteers, and we're extremely grateful for, for, for their help with this. So Tom mentioned that uh, there's both research and teaching interests at the site. So the the site in, in terms of geography is pretty close to the centre of Leeds, it's on the kind of urban fringe. And so that means it's really um, suitable, it's, it's very accessible, we can get there by bus. So taking students for taught field courses is a is a good option. Um, it's also a great opportunity to teach some of the field skills that perhaps um, some of the some of the courses are kind of losing in, in, in recent years. So it's just a, yeah, a great opportunity to get the students outside without having to go kind of away for a long residential trip. Um, and we're hoping we've, we've kind of designed things so that the annual field trips that undergraduates take will start to build up a sort of annual data set that over time will create something really valuable so that students can collect their data and then kind of reflect back on the data that's been collected in in, in previous years and build up a kind of continuous data uh, log. One of the key things that's been really just 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 brilliant over the last year is the the interest and involvement we've had from students doing their undergraduate and, and postgraduate sort of dissertation and, and thesis projects. So these images are are some from some some small mammal monitoring um, and some browser monitoring on the on the left hand side. Um, and this this monitoring work was actually able to kind of feed into how we thought about the design of the site. So by having a better idea of pressures from from browsers and the likelihood of, of um, encountering small mammals, um, we could actually kind of feed that into the to the design process. It also means that we've got baseline data there, so we can look back next year and, and later on at how the numbers have been affected. Similarly, for the invertebrate monitoring, um, the the site as it was was um, kind of fairly uniform in terms of the the kinds of grasslands that were there, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the the invertebrate diversity changes as the the trees start to establish and and develop. 
So what's next for Gare Wood? Well, really, it's just to, we're all quite excited about actually doing some of the research that we've kind of been, been planning. Um, so we've got lots of data collection planned for this summer. We've also got some ponds that you, you might have spotted on, on Anna's maps to be to be going in on the, the north of the site that we're hoping to, to, to get in this year. We want to upgrade the, the infrastructure so that we can actually have some kind of physical teaching spaces there. I think that will help us to, to kind of do a wider range of things. And the Anna showed on her map some of the um, the kind of public access routes through the site. So um, a small portion of the site will be opened up quite soon this year. And then over the next five years, we'll be doing some monitoring of um, pedestrian and traffic kind of counts around the area to do a kind of proper impact um, analysis before opening the, the, the second um, access route through. And I just want to end by saying a massive thank you to the, 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 the team. I think Anna kind of alluded to the, the diverse kind of set of people that came together to make this project happen. And it, it, you know, it wouldn't have been possible without all of these different people and, and organisations. So, um, yeah, thank you very much to everyone here and thank you for listening. So we're, we're happy to answer your questions now. But if you've got anything specifically on the kind of research side, you're welcome to get in touch with us directly at this email address. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh... Anna, Kat and Tom, and uh, thanks for coming back online. And thanks to those people in the chat who've already been posing some questions. I've jotted some of them down. Um, we'll, we'll start the question and answer session off, but Sarah is also going to be monitoring the chat to pick up on some of those that I've not been able to um, pick up on. Uh, the first question was from Helen Townsend, and I'm going to direct it to Anna, which was uh, about whether the permissive paths in the design have got any uh, protection on them. Have they been made into formal public rights of way or is it just all permissive routes? Anna, are you able to answer that question? Thanks. Yes, yes, I can. Um, the permissive paths are going to, are, we're talking to Leeds City Council at the moment about getting them on the public rights of way. They will be permissive, so that means that the university um, retains the ability to close them should they need to be doing any additional work um, and that is in progress and when we um, register all the permissive paths with Lisa to Council it'll be for the um, the path that will be opened in later years will we'll all be registered and we're also monitoring footfall on that path that was part of our consultation agreement. Excellent. Thanks for that, Anna. The second question that I jotted down was from Beth, and perhaps I'd like to target it to Anna and then Kat and Tom. The first part of the um, um, question was how much young people have been involved in the project, were they involved in the stakeholder group? And, and the second part of that question was about any analysis done on where people live in relation to the woodlands so the kind of distance that people can get to it on foot or by car or by public transport but uh, Anna maybe do you want to kick off in terms of the involvement of young people in the process and then either Kat or Tom to pick up on any analysis of uh, on the kind of distances people are from the woodlands thanks. Okay um, I think Kat and Tom can also actually answer the second one as well because um, the volunteering side had a lot of involvement of young people including sustainability architects and these are students that are involved in the uh, sustainable st sustainability services um, projects, they're, they're existing students within the university. Um, we on the steering group it was um there were no st students on the steering group but there were um we did contact the student union as part of the consultation process and we did um uh, advertise very widely the um opportunity for students to volunteer and in the future there's going to be a wide program for that um a sort of of regular visits maintenance um so I think that's enough from me. Then go back to Kat and Scott. Uh, yeah, I guess just to add that, um, yeah, for the so a lot of the students were involved, you know, young people. It isn't so much feeding into the design, but but in actually planning the, you know, the volunteer planning itself. And uh, I think a lot of young people from the community, mostly, I guess, more school age, coming along with their with their parents to um, to take part. Yeah, I suppose in terms of the design, it was the the views of the 
the local the community living locally that were taken um was sort of the, the most important to kind of take into account so that's that's really how we structured the the consultation with the involvement of students we had i mean i think from, from i tried to show in, in in our presentation that a lot of the a lot of the data that's been collected so far has been done by students and then that data has then been used to actually inform the design so sort of indirectly their information was able to contribute to 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 pushing the design forwards what, what was the uh, the second part of the question again the second part was about any analysis of um, use ah. in terms of where people mm -hmm. live and the proximity to people who can get there on foot on yeah. bike by car or public transport thanks it's a so that's a really good question and actually what we the the site at the moment is kind of directly in between two, I think Anna, Anna showed on one of her slides that there's footpaths to the north and coming in from the, the west of the site as well. And so really we were kind of concerned with people being able to use those existing footpaths, but taking them off the bits of the road that they have to, to walk along. Um, so it's not so much, we aren't, and we aren't necessarily trying to attract more visitors to the area with the, the presence of the site but we're trying to improve things for the people who are visiting so they're not having to walk walk along the roadsides um in terms of provision on the site the again it kind of it all links together really because ultimately it's meant to be a kind of a a route through as opposed to a destination that people might um kind of target specifically and that's yeah, there's lots of reasons for that but one of them is that it's already a really really busy area with lots of people visiting the adjacent park and so there was concern about well if we create a new attraction let's say that, that lots of people are coming to visit you know there isn't necessarily the infrastructure to support that and so we tried to be mindful of that in the design process and i think it's worth adding as well because obviously as well as the traffic from site users who are just accessing the permissive paths obviously we'll be bringing people on site so especially large undergraduate field courses so it's important to say that we are you know ensuring that there's a presumption towards public transport to get to the site and not not trying not to add road traffic making sure that mm -hmm. if people are traveling by car they're not parking on verges or anything like that around around the site so trying not to increase the impact on on what is already quite a busy road in the area Excellent. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, changing tack slightly and just to bring you in, there was a question from James about how to get into the sector. And I can see there's been a response in the chat about the apprenticeship programme. But you and any thoughts about we need to kind of grow the capacity of the sector to be able to deliver an ambitious target? Any thoughts you'd like to put into the panel? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges that we have is, you know, like a lot of sectors, Currently, you know, we we do we do have a shortage of um, people who are with the required sort of skill set and you know and qualifications. I think, particularly amongst the community forest, we've tended to be where we can be flexible and look for sort of similar um, skills and qualifications that you know that kind of in the field. You know, if you go back to things that you know we we're dealing an awful lot with landowners, so actually we you know we have people who maybe have a more agricultural rather than forestry background. There are opportunities around volunteering, but clearly, you know, as I said, that that is unpaid. Um, the challenge that we have currently is is kind of the longevity of our funding in order to be able to invest um, for people. But what I would say is if anyone is is interested, you know, to drop me a line um, and, you know, in terms of where they're, they're located, and sort of work with and maybe find opportunities where people can kind of engage in a more meaningful way, but also even with volunteering to get people into the into the sector. You know, we, we're not going to there aren't enough foresters to go around and we need to spread um, the word and to find things that there's lots of other opportunities that where people have got specific skill sets and and the like. Um, and it could even be around things like surveying and things like that, where it's quite specialist. It may even involve things like drones and other techniques, et cetera. But undoubtedly, you know, as picked on this project, but across the board, you know, we're going to need an awful lot of data in the future to inform future management decisions, et cetera. So I think there's plenty of scope. I think the understanding is for an individual is what their skill set and interest is and how we can uh, point them in the right direction. Excellent. Thanks for that, Ewan. And conscious that we're heading towards the close, but I am going to turn to Sarah just to pick up on uh, uh, a further question. 
Sarah, if that's OK. Yes, no problem. Um, so last question um, from Philip. Um, how will the woodland be managed and are there plans to coppice or create pollards? Pollards are excellent for the biodiversity associated with dead wood, wood habitat. Do you expect problems with roe deer? Shall I start with that one? OK, yes, there are areas of coppice. What we did around the power lines where we have to keep the trees below a certain height and at a certain distance, we deliberately put in areas of coppice and we spoke to the Leeds coppice workers and, and they gave us some great advice about the design to make sure that it, you have significant amount of coppice areas to make it um, viable for them to coppice. But also we use that in the northern part of the site where we wanted to keep that um, feeling of open space. Um, so there's uh, a, a lot of coppice included and um, in terms of standing dead wood and, and pollarding and things like that, that's all going to be part of the ongoing um, ma maintenance by the estates department. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for those that have uh, put comments and, and questions in the chat. Um, maybe just to finish with one final, because I, I spotted it and it's a taxing question in relation to woodland creation. So it's worth us just uh, airing it quickly, which was on about the tenant farmer and the previous land use, whether there was any kind of challenges or issues as associated with moving from um, you know, agricultural use to uh, mixed uh, woodland. Thanks. We can, yeah, we can come in on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so just to say, this, the the tenant farmer, the the farm didn't kind of represent the, or the the fields in question didn't represent the sort of sum total of of his the area that he farms. It was actually um, he, he was a local farmer who was essentially renting those fields from the university for extra extra grazing. Um, and, and so, yeah, I I think that one of the things and one of the questions that I think came up in the consultation was, you know moving moving the land from agriculture to, to woodland and I, I you know as part of the UKFS I think that is you know that is assessed to make sure that we're not moving kind of very productive land out of um, out of production. Thanks for that and maybe just to finish off on that theme I've just come uh, from a two-day conference with the Institute of Chartered Foresters looking at agroforestry and you know the recognition that it's really important that we work with the farming community on supporting land use change and that we recognise there's some real depth of understanding and experience in terms of land management from that farming community. I'm going to draw it to a close now. I've got a few uh, thank yous to, to deliver, um, starting off with the speakers. Um, thanks to you and uh, Anna, Kat and Tom for delivering some great presentations um, uh, which have clearly prompted a range of questions in the chat. Um, thanks to all the attendees for joining us um, this afternoon and for your engagement and uh, the, the comments and, uh, and questions that have been raised. Um, we will look to um, um, provide a kind of follow-up of the um, recording and also be in touch to um, uh, kind of uh, provide contact details for people that have uh, uh, been involved today in terms of a follow-up email. Um, I wanted to thank the SC team because obviously sat behind this uh, uh, people like Sarah, Becca, um, uh, Paul and Robin that have helped come together in the background to answer the questions and put it all together. Um, uh, and I hope you've found it a really useful session and uh, to me the kind of enduring you know, thoughts where it's fantastic to see such a project come into fruition following you know, a really uh, clear design process that has sought to get the evidence and understanding of the site, the kind of ambitions and opportunities of local communities and the, uh, uh, and the people around the project and to actually see it now being delivered on the ground. So, um, you know, we are in a, uh, we do have a kind of nature crisis and a climate change emergency. So actually taking action and making a difference by doing schemes like this um, is key. So thanks for that. And if anyone on the webinar this afternoon has got an interest in woodland creation, do get in touch, get in touch with um, any of the Forest Commission team or, or if you're in North or West Yorkshire, the White Rose Forest team, we're kind of working in a one team approach where we just help each other signpost people to the right contacts. So um, yeah, if it's sparked an interest in planting trees, do get in touch, uh, but it 
now is exactly 15.30 and we'll draw things to a close. So thanks very much for your attendance and participation in this afternoon's webinar.